you are having a hard time hearing me. And uh, let's see how we're doing in just a few more minutes, just a few more seconds. If you want to peruse our agenda, you can also hop into the chat and start looking through the files. We have some files there with the materials that we're going to be using for the day, as well as the slides. And I'll be adding a link to the video in the chat. All right, I think it's time. So here's our agenda for today. We're going to start with an in, with the introduction, so you can see who this person is trying to teach you some stuff. And then uh, we've got our, we're going to talk about our group norms and expectations super quick, just to see what the district put out there. Uh, setting an intention with sound, we started with that, so we might just do just one minute of that. And a uh, quick overview of the brain, child development, and learning. It's really an overview of kind of education. Um, like kind of how it evolved and why why there's such a high need for special education uh, services and why there's such a discrepancy um, in the people being um, identified as needing special education services. Then we'll go into some tools and tips and resources. So I've got some things that I've created uh, as well as uh, some different resources and templates understanding IEP language. So we will do a little activity where we'll take a, a, a look at a student, a student at a glance, the IEP at a glance. So you can start to connect the goals that, that we write as, as uh, RSPs or as, as SPED teachers and, and what that looks like in the classrooms as, as far as strategies and support. And uh, we'll have a group activity around that and then closing. So. Does anybody have any questions about the agenda before we get started? And uh, all right, and then we're going to go over the norms. Let me, I'll, I'll, we'll go over the norms in a second and I'll let you know all the different ways you can ask a question, but you can just hop in if you have a question. Let's see. Oh, here was today's resources, which I've actually already pulled up, so we're not going to pull that up. Nakia, um, this is Nicole. I'm just seeing that some of our participants are having a hard time hearing. Okay. Um, if you could, my volume is up and I think just your tone is a little soft. It's better. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Is that better? Here, I'll bring it up yes, a little more. Yes, thank you. All right. You're welcome. I like, I, I got plenty of tech to fix that problem. Okay. You can hear me? Oh, right. Uh, yeah, just keep let. just thank you so much, Nicole. And uh, we're going to keep on moving. So let's get back over here into our present. Who is this person? Okay, so my name is Nikia Wright. Here's a little, uh, this is actually a documentary that was done a few years ago. It's very short. It's only one minute. And there we go. Let's go back. I was born in the middle of the drug war. When crack came into our community, it was like a bomb went off. My mom went into prison when I was five. I was in an abusive home situation with my dad. I was the oldest and I had an eight-year-old sister and one and a half-year-old brother. After many years of living in constant fear, it was like, we gotta go. That was the scariest thing I think I've ever done. I ended up staying with four different foster families. I stayed in the system until I was 21. I decided to do a master's in special education. It became clear to me that the students didn't have disabilities. Their environment was disabling. I ended up helping develop programs, connecting concepts of gardening to math, science, reading, art. I can't imagine doing anything else but serving. I mean, with the life that I've had and just the amount of need that's within poor Black communities, it's not something that's outside of me, it's, it's my family. Okay. And was everyone able to hear that? I'm always trying to figure out the volume. Where is everyone able to hear? Great. 
All right, so that is me. I've been in, I've been in this game for a minute, um, and I've I've been you know, uh, and in a lot of different um, environments, um, different places of the country, different places of the world. Really trying to figure out how to best serve you. Here we go, and let's go back. And so, um, currently, I am at Willie Brown Middle School. I'm an RSP, and I'm, I'm supporting supporting uh, the sixth and the eighth grade. Does anybody have any questions just about me and my background before we move forward? And I, I, I'm still. This is Nicole again. I'm sorry to interrupt. If you click the bottom of your screen, there's a closed caption button for those that are still having some trouble hearing. Oh. Here. And that'll put up text. Just click on it and that'll te do a text to speech. Great. Or speech to text. That might help as well. All right. How's that? Hello, hello. Okay. So, ooh, I love this. Thank you so much. So, let's see if we can get back to our presenter mode. And I don't know if we have Nope. Give me one minute. Figure out why the. All right, group expectations and norms. So, this is what the district put out in regards to expectations. I'm hearing some feedback too. I don't know where that's coming from. Anyways, here's what the district put out as far as expectations. So, this is what we should expecting. Um, from from the teachers and this is uh, how how you know we should be running our, our lesson so welcoming being a role model setting clear expectations um, being comfortable asking for feedback consider your back uh, your background and microphone uh, and uh, remember to focus on human interaction so here's here's some of the things that we that we're fo that we're focusing on and here's what we uh, want to see from the students and be reminding the students of. So being respectful, considering their digital footprint, especially um, as youth, for them, like for their safety. Uh, and so just remembering, like how, how, just being sure to remind them, especially around, like don't share your personal or private information, um, considering your, their background and microphone, not recording other students, especially, or not recording anything without people's permission, that's actually illegal in California and asking for help if you get lost. And so for us today, let's go ahead and just set our norms for what uh, we want our, how we want our, our workshop to run. Uh, I, I don't mind if folks pop in with the, uh, just unmute yourself if you have a question or a comment and I might, I might be in the middle of something, you know, just let me finish my sentence and uh but please please do that i'm not um nicole is also keeping an eye on the chat so if you've got you know throw something in the chat nicole let let me know and uh you can also uh you know just wave your hand the best is a for me is a, is a sound cue so if you just unmute for a second if you don't if you're if you're just watching you don't have anything to say please stay muted um, it'll just help us with background noise and stuff like that. So moving forward, does anybody have any questions about our norms, expectations? All right, we're going to keep it moving. So setting an intention with sound. So let's decide, let's just each of us individually decide what we want to how, what, like how we, uh, what we want to get out of this workshop. And what I would like to do is pull up here, the poll. So, nope, we're not doing that. Let's go back. So, our, so what kind of intention do you want to set for, what do you want to get out of this workshop? What's most important? to you as far as uh, getting started for, for next year with virtual support. Um, you can throw it in the chat. Let me get over here so I can see the chat. All 
Oh, thank you so much, Gemma. I'm just now getting into this chat. So go ahead and throw into the chat any, um, any just what kind of intentions you want to set. And while we're thinking about that, I'm just going to play uh, some soothing sounds. Right, and so thank you so much for the folks that, that have started adding uh, adding some comments in. So we have uh, helping helping transition students with uh, job skills through remote learning. Ooh, yeah. So what what are some skills that can translate into job skills? Is that what you're saying, Paul, um, in regards to remote learning? So not just how to navigate it for school, but come out with something that they could actually. Mm -hmm, that's a great. And uh, consistency, being present, um, new to working with high school, so learning how to support and engage older students. All right, excellent. Anyone else have anything they want to add into the chat? I'd like to know how to continue that. Oh, how they'll continue their internships. It's a big challenge. Uh huh. And keeping strong connections with students to keep them engaged with this in distance learning. Zoom meeting yet? Okay, so how to practice, oh yeah, supporting the families with new system. And what we'll do is we'll save this chat because I, y'all, these are all very important and I definitely want to save, like, save this and share it with the paraeducator team um, as, as well as, and I can answer some of these um, a little later if we don't get to it in the presentation today. Wonderful. Okay, and... Yeah, just getting practice with the Zoom meeting. So for some, for some of them, um, I, I'm not. I, I know that there's going to be a little extra time in the schedule for paraeducators to meet with teachers and things like that. And I wonder if that there could be some time to give you a chance to practice, you know, leading a Zoom session or a breakout session or something like that. Um, so checking in with teams around that so you can get some practice ahead of time because I wanted to try poll today, but I haven't done it before. So I would like to practice that before doing that with the class. Um, yes, excellent. So we're just going to keep on moving forward. Education in the U.S. today. So I think I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to bring this over. All right, so education in the U.S. today, and we have a little video, and so this kind of, I, I just, it'll, it'll, this will kind of, this kind of breaks down education to, like, how I, how I've come to, to see what we've been doing. I just don't like the beginning of that, though. We're just, I'm, I'm going to keep this. Public education. There are two reasons for it. The first of them is economic. People are trying to f work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? The second, though, is cultural. Every country on earth, on earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way, they're alienating 
millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school, we were kept there with a story, which was if you worked hard and did well and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. Some people say we have to raise standards as if this is a breakthrough. You know, like, really, yes, I, we should. Why would you lower them? You know, I, mean, I, I haven't come across an argument that persuades me of lowering them. But raising them, of course we should raise them. The problem is that the current system of education was designed and conceived and structured for a different age. It was conceived in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment and in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. Before the middle of the 19th century, there were no systems of public education. Not really. I mean, you could get educated by Jesuits, you know, if, if you had the money. But public education, paid for from taxation, compulsory to everybody and free at the point of delivery, that was a revolutionary idea. And many people objected to it. They said it's not possible for many street kids, working class children, to benefit from public education. They're incapable of learning to read and write, and why are we spending time on this? So there's also built into it a whole series of um, assumptions about social structure and capacity. It was driven by an economic imperative of the time, but running right through it um, was an intellectual model of the mind, which was essentially the Enlightenment view of intelligence. That real intelligence consists in the capacity for a certain type of deductive reasoning and a knowledge of the classics originally. What we come to think of as academic ability. And this is deep in the gene pool of public education, that there are really two types of people, academic and non-academic, smart people and non-smart people. And the consequence of that is that many brilliant people think they're not, because they've been judged against this particular view of the mind. So we have a, a twin pillars, economic and intellectual. And my view is that this model has caused chaos in many people's lives. It's been great for some. There have been people who have benefited wonderfully from it. But most people have not. Instead, they suffer this. This is the modern epidemic, and it's as misplaced, and it's as fictitious. This is the plague of ADHD. Now, this is a map of the instance of ADHD in America, or prescriptions for ADHD. Don't mistake me here. I don't mean to say there is no such thing as attention deficit disorder. I'm not qualified to say if there is such a thing. I know that a great majority of psychologists and, and pediatricians think there is such a thing. But it's still a matter of, dis of debate. What I do know for a fact is it's not an epidemic. These kids are being medicated as routinely as we had our tonsils taken out. And on the same whimsical basis, and for the same reason, medical fashion. Our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the earth. They're being besieged with information and calls for their attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising audience, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalizing them now for getting distracted. From what? You know, boring stuff <laughs> at school, for the most part. It seems to me it's not a coincidence totally that the instance of ADHD has risen in parallel with the growth of standardized testing. Now, these kids are being given Ritalin and Adderall and all manner of things, often quite dangerous drugs, to get them focused and calm them down. But according to this, attention deficit order increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. <laughs> separate reasons for that, I believe. <laughs> it's a fictitious... But the arts, and I don't say this exclusively the arts, I think it's also true of science and of math, but it are the victims of this mentality currently, particularly. The arts especially address the idea of aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at their peak. When you're present in the current moment, 
when you're resonating with the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing, when you are fully alive. An anesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children through education by anesthetizing them. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up to what they have inside of themselves. But the model of education that is less of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, so ringing bells, separate facilities, uh, specialized into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. What do you mean? Well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines, you know, or at different times of the day, or better in smaller groups than in large groups, or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula, and it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. There was a great study done recently of divergent thinking. It was published a couple of years ago. Divergent thinking isn't the same thing as creativity. I define creativity as the, the process of having original ideas that have value. Divergent thinking isn't a synonym, but it's a, an essential capacity for creativity. It's the ability to see lots of possible answers to a question, lots of possible ways of interpreting a question, uh, to think what Edward de Bono would probably call laterally, uh, to think not just in linear or convergent ways, uh, to see multiple answers, not one. So, I mean, there are tests for this. I mean, one kind of cod example would be people might be asked to say, how many uses can you think of for a paperclip? One well, of those routine questions. Most people might come up with 10 or 15. People who are good at this might come up with 200. And they do that by saying, well, could the paperclip be 200 foot tall and be made out of foam rubber? You know, like, does it have to be a paperclip as we know it, Jim? You know. Um, now, they're tested this, and they gave them to 1,500 people. This is in a book called Breakpoint and Beyond. And on the protocol of the test, if you scored above a certain level, you'd be considered to be a genius at divergent thinking. Okay? So, my question to you is, what percentage of the people tested, of the 1,500, scored at genius level for divergent thinking? Now, you need to know one more thing about them. These were kindergarten children. So what do you think? What percentage at genius level? 80. 80. 80, okay. 98%. Now, the thing about this was it was a longitudinal study. So they retested the same children five years later, aged 8 to 10. What do you think? 50. They retested them again five years later, ages uh, 13 to 15. You can see a trend here, can't you? <laughs> Now, this tells an interesting story, because you could have imagined it going the other way, couldn't you? You start off not being very good, but you get better as you get older. But this shows two things. One is, we all have this capacity. And two, it mostly deteriorates. Now, a lot of things have happened to these kids as they've grown up. A lot. But one of the most important things that happened to them, I'm convinced, is that by now, they've become educated. You know, they've spent 10 years at school being told there's one answer, it's at the back. And don't look. And don't copy, because that's cheating. I mean, outside schools, that's called collaboration. You know, but inside schools. Now, this isn't because teachers want it this way. It's just because it happens that way. Um, it's because it's in the gene pool of education. We have to think differently about human capacity. We have to get over this old conception of academic, non-academic, abstract, theoretical, vocational, uh, and see it for what it is, um, a myth. Uh, secondly, we have to recognize that most great learning happens in groups, that collaboration is the stuff of growth. If we atomize people and separate them and judge them separately, we form a kind of disjunction between them and their natural learning environment. And thirdly, it's crucially about the culture of our institutions, the habits of the institution 
and the habitats that they occupy. All right, I got my mic fixed while that was happening, so I hope y'all can hear me a little better now. That um, that particular uh, video ends right there, but I think I think the point they get the point across. the The audio on that video ends at that moment, uh, and so let's go ahead to our discussion question. So I would love to hear people's thoughts. Uh, what came up as you were watching this? Were there some things that, uh, yes, it's actually in the slide. So uh, all the, this whole slide is, is in your, uh, in the uh, Google Drive that Nicole has been posting right here in the chat. And uh, so what, what are some thoughts that came up? What have you noticed in the classroom? Um, what have you noticed about the youth that we're serving? We're serving a very particular population, and um, and I will definitely share my thoughts. But I I want to hear what what you've been seeing. What is are you seeing things that align with what was mentioned in that video? Uh, what is this bringing up to you about teaching, education system, and our role in the classroom? Oh great! So students know, students know that this uh, that that this ADHD is non-existence. May I? Yep. Yes. Mm-hmm. Keep on going. So uh, Jim says. Uh, so Tim says students know that this uh, ADHD is. I'm gonna take this one off. It's, I'm just having a hard time with these mics today. Um, that the ADHD is non-existent, that uh, um, Gemma says this is about the elite to weed out the ones that can't make it. And it's not the ones who can't make it because someone who can come up with lots of opportunities and ways to solve problems is actually gonna be pretty successful. So, so they're not weeding out the people who can't make it. Who are they weeding out? Thank you so much, Nicole. And you can you can hop in. So we're you can hop in with the um, on the uh, uh, just uh, unmute yourself if you'd like to share that way too. But what what are like what are we noticing? Like it, it, it's uh, I, I like what uh, what's being said. But let let's get to the let's get to the the nitty gritty gritty of weeding out the poor and disadvantaged. Yes, growing up in this learning, uh, in this form or learning paradigm, and it is outdated. Mm hmm. Any other thoughts that are coming coming up? And then, what does it look like right now when we recognize this? We recognize where we've been. We recognize that we are on a journey. You know that the education system is on a journey. And um and uh oh which we got some more uh so this is what's happening with Betsy DeVos, DeVos and the charter school public ed public private education schools yes it's not that the child can't focus but it's boring for the child to be sitting and actively participating in class well if they were actively if there were ways for them to actively participate that were accessible to them would they be vo bored um one shoe fits all and um out the ones with that fit the fit oh one shoe fits all and out with the ones that fit the one's shoe sides yes and it's just about those who fit that one shoe sides right um the college system is mainly based on profit and law no no longer on education so we're seeing how this is an impacting um this how we're in this is impacting higher education as well. Facilitate learning through collaborative approach, not a cookie cutter type of education. Everybody learns differently. So so yes, 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 yes. Anybody else got anything they want to add? And then let's start bringing this to um, what, how, how does this translate into the classroom? You know, with, with bringing this, like with this knowledge, <laughs> with this knowledge um 
what what does this what what does this say about teaching and and how how we should be teaching youth and how we should be supporting youth specifically youth who've been identified as having a disability anyone have anything we want to add okay so i'll i'm going to share some examples of of ways that um, too many educators, not the majority lucky, think there's only one way to behave and are too focused on strict discipline and punishment. Yes, so they have a one, they have, it's, it's only, there's only one way to do it. And if you don't do it the way that you, I've told you to do it, then it's punitive. Um, and uh, yes. And and specifically for our students. So so then let's 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 just um, look at some of the data, right? Just our our qualitative um, and some quantitative data. We don't have the numbers in front of us, but we've seen it. We've lived it. So what does the percentage do? do does the the say if you take all of SFUSD? and you look at the students by race and by class, and then you look at the, you know, just whole public school education, and then you look at the special education system. Is it, does it, does the data correlate? Do you have the same percentage of students who say are black or Latino or white um, students from poor classes, or do you have the same percentage of students um, in special ed that relates directly to the percentage of students in in the education system as a whole? Does it correlate evenly? Let me know if that question's not clear. I've, I don't think I've asked it in that way before. Okay, Mirabella says, uh, I was lucky that all my teachers had to be in that one way but for their students change it up so that all the students were taught to their advantages so everyone learned with fun activities included yes um uh and so so what i've noticed in this in this field from my very first special education uh teacher job back in 2007 um is that there's a disproportionate amount of black youth, specifically young black men in the special education system. And I, I've seen it in every school across the nation, the same thing. It's, it, it is disproportionate by, by, and it's very clear. It's, it's very clear the first school I taught at was a school in, in DC, it was a charter school for students uh, which, with emotional disabilities. Um, the classification is an emotional disturbance. I don't agree with that. However, what I noticed was that every child in that school was black and that the majority of those, those, those youth were black, young black men. And they, um, many of them, had where their academic skills were very low and it was very clear that they had very little access to even fundamental reading and math skills and i saw them when they were in high school and they were being these were they they i they were they were regular people responding the way any normal human would respond in to the circumstances that they were in okay so what i'm saying is any human is going to act a certain way if they're put in a specific situation that does not make them disabled that just make that is a human responding to an environmental factor okay and these environmental factors are real and many of them are connected to racism and it impacts our families ability to get access to resources to get access to child care to get access to food to get you know like it impacts everything and of course we are going to see that in our children 
because they don't live in they don't live in silos and my concern was that these children were being told that they had disabilities when in in reality the environment was disabling them so that that is how i early on was like wow i'm in a weird situation because I would much rather me be serving these students than someone who doesn't actually can, hasn't come to that conclusion yet and um, might be coming from a more more of a, a, a white supremacist view of education and authoritarian view of education. I would much rather be serving these students. But every day that I have to say that this child has a disability, when I know that their <laughs> environment, they, there's, and until we can assess the impact of, that the environment is having on their learning, I don't think we can legal clearly, I don't think we can clearly discern whether they actually have a disability or not. Um, and so I began talking to my students about it and, and sharing information with them about hey like education the education system is not stagnant someone put in the chat that they're you know what what we experienced in as in in the classroom is different from what our students experience in the classroom and hopefully it's getting better and so what i would tell my students is there's nothing wrong with you you have a right to feel the way that you feel um you haven't had access to what you needed and and you and you need support but you don't need support because there's anything wrong with you you need support because there's something wrong with the system <laughs> okay and together we can start creating a, an alternative we can start coming up with new ways that will will teach you what you need to know but in a way that feels right for you so let's create this together Okay, and that conversation, just that one conversation um, every year with my new students shifted the way that they thought about school because not only were they being told there was nothing wrong with them, when all this time they've been trying their best and all of these people, most of them who don't represent them or their culture are telling them that they, they're doing something wrong. And they're just doing what any human their age with their access to resources would be doing. And so once I started realizing that, okay, let's assume that they are doing their best and let's get them in on it so that they are now a part of creating the future, okay? Um, and, and that is how I personally have navigated this. Even with that, I've had to step away a few times. Um, and I've had to reassess and I've had to go out and look at different models and check out what other countries were doing because even that didn't feel like enough. And, um, and, and so, so that, that's, that is what, that's how I've, I've shifted kind of in my, in my teaching now. Um, I want to get into some of the tips and tools and resources that are in this folder here, okay? And you all should all have access. So one of the first things, um, actually before I even went into classroom teaching, I was actually a, uh, I was a, a, my first teaching job was on a boat. It was on an 80 year old wooden vessel and I would take DC youth out um, and I didn't know anything about boats. It was an environmental education program. I didn't know anything about environmental education. I'm just down for a good time. And it sounded like an awesome job. And it was. So, um, so and I learned so much. I ended up actually managing um, the education program b b b before by the time I left. And um, it was all around project-based learning and it shifted. It just like from the beginning, I got this different approach to learning. So instead of there being a set answer, right? It's more of an inquiry base. And I'm not guiding them towards an answer that I think is correct. 
I legit don't know the answer. We don't know, we're going to explore, okay? And one of the best ways to do this is through project-based learning. And so uh, what, what we did for that program is we connected many, uh, we connected many of, of the activities on the boat to the learning benchmarks, so to the education standards, to the common core standards, to the math and reading, and like actually, you know, when we're doing this activity, you got to read, you know, you got to do all these, so let's put it all in there. And um, it, I found on that program, teachers were coming back and saying, these students, these were these were DC public school students who most of them, like I said, had not really had experience, like, you know, not really had many outdoor experiences. It was mostly grant funded, so it was mostly public school students. And teachers were coming back and saying that the students were who normally in the classroom were not engaged, students who were on caseloads, students who were, had been said that they'd had emotional disturbances, all of these things, they came out on my program and not only were they totally engaged, there were no behavioral problems. There, you know, like it, it was like a totally different student, but when they got back to school, they were so excited about what they learned about the ecology of the river, about taking care of the river. And they didn't learn it because I was lecturing like I'm doing now, you know, like we're adults. I got a lot of inflammation. I wish we could do a hands-on, but you know, no, this was all inquiry based. We are going to collect samples of fish and investigate them. We're going to collect samples of plankton and investigate them. So these were all different um, activities that they, and then afterwards I would pose questions and they would come up with their solutions. And these students went back to school and started advocating for their environment and talking to their, their peers, you know, when they saw them littering and things like that. And teachers were responding that they really saw a shift in, you know, like in, in this, these students. And so that's one of the main reasons why I decided to go into special education because I saw how project-based learning could actually make learning more accessible for, uh, for all students and um, because not everyone has to do the same thing in a project you know you can find your strength or you can decide hey I'm not really good at this but I want to learn how to do it so I'm gonna you know I'm gonna kind of you know stretch myself but there's choice around it and students who normally never have a chance to feel successful can find a way and so these these are lessons that I've I've created and you can see how I just pulled. So the first one we actually did at Willie Brown last year and I had a, I wrote a grant and we wrote a grant for like 5,000. We had about 10 students um, and uh, it was an after school program and they built their own businesses. They made business plans. They, uh, they created their budget. We invited local business leaders to come in and talk to them. After they created their business plans, they actually, from their budget, I, I purchased the materials that they needed and they actually created the products that they needed for their businesses. Some of them went on to create Instagram pages and they're selling their products. And the whole point of it was to create a business that was going to serve their community. So it was going to solve a problem in their community. And um, even if you don't have the 5K to buy the materials, they can still create their plan. They can still create their budget. Um, and there's always, you know, opportunities maybe to choose one or, or you know, do a donor's choose or something like that if you want to go a little deeper. Um, another is a garden-based learning. So I, I built a, a, a curriculum for the Nature Conservancy that was used in, in uh, schools around the country on uh, pollinator gardens and how to design a garden. So this was how, teaching the students how to design a garden that would um that would attract pollinators and talking about the food chain and all of that and so um you can see here i don't put standards because standards are like different depending on where you are 
this is for my personal company and I'm trying to start an international education business. So um, I kept it to skills so you could see what skills and then people could figure out how they plugged into their own standards wherever they are. How to make soap, we made soap last year at Willie Brown and the students, um, this is actually not one. Um, the other two you could do as distance learning plans. This one was something that uh, you can do this if you get if you purchase the the soap base. This was a chemistry lesson, so I really wanted them to see the 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 transition from oil and lye and water to soap and that saponification process. So we did this in class. You don't want to do this independently and be no, it's not no. Um, just with the lie. So this is something you could do as a demonstration, um, or have students come up with their own. And then here are just a few more that I'm going to be putting into my um, curriculum. So gaming math, where uh, remedial math is such an issue, is, is such an issue and a concern. And uh, many, many times the students just, they need more, they, 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 they need to be learning things in a smaller group or individually, or during a time of day that is, is that works better for them. And so if they miss these fundamental skills, um, and they then it then they they have nothing to build on the next year and so I created the gaming math so that students could create games um, to uh, practice remedial math skills interpreting data for justice that is a uh, that that's just going through different studies on the the drug war and the impact that it had on the black community looking at the data and interpreting it and then coming up with projects it's really fun. There's some there's an art component to it. Um, so these are just some ideas of of ways to to use projects, you know, to um, to enhance learning um, and and ways to think about if you have a skill, uh, how you could turn it into something usable um, for the students. And now I'm just going to do a quick chat check. Let's see. Um, if you've got a question or anything, just let me know. Thank you so much, Nicole. Project based in all subjects, even and not just science. Yes, actually, it should be collaborative because it, it, you see the, what that you you see the the. Let me go back. Um, actually, you, you saw like there's math, there's English, there's art. So it, imagine when a, a team of teachers is collaborating. You can really plan out a project for a whole term in just a f in just like a few hours, and then people can have their own little parts. And imagine if like for a whole term, everything that the students were learning was connected. It wasn't oh I'm gonna go learn this thing in math, but then I'm only gonna use that. I'm only gonna be talking about that one particular you know skill in math, and then you know. Oh, well, why not in science? You know, if you're learning geometry, do the, uh, you could build, you know, tiny house models or, you know, you got to build a scale model or, you know, and then for, for, for English and ELA, well, let's write a report and explain the importance, like, why do we need tiny houses and who could this impact and what? So there's so many ways to streamline things, which overall would make it so much easier for teachers um, and staff because you already like it's it's once once you got your project plan and you have your materials it's like plug and play and uh, and you have way more time to just engage with the kids so um another thing is uh okay let me go let me get in here no i don't want to go into that one i think i have one up here um so another thing is how how to to when we notice that particular skills are not, um, you know, like like the particular skills, so um, math, right? You gonna you need it. You, we need it. Math is we are, and we're always using math, and uh, and so I created this little survival guide to just like help help students, especially middle school students who might have some gaps. And first of all, since they're in middle school, they, can, they, they have a little bit more higher level thinking. So like giving them like, this is what math is. So does someone want to read out what 
um, just read out, like take one person to read what math is, what a number is, an integer, and a ratio. Anyone? Y'all gonna make me do all the talking today? <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Go ahead. Oh no, I'll I'll do it. I'll do it, Nicole. Well, if you can uh, put it like bigger so we can see it, because I cannot see it. Oh, thank you for letting me know. Hold on, let me do that. And let's see if this is coming up. Okay. All right. Are you able to see it now? Yes. Yes, Matt. The study of the shapes, patterns, and numbers. Great. I think I forgot a T in that patterns. Thank you so much. Uh, what about numbers? So now we're moving on. If people know what a shape is. You know what a pattern is. We have an idea of what numbers, but what like what is a number? A count or a measurement. Great. A, a count or a measurement. And then now we're getting into types of numbers. So one is an integer. Can someone tell me what an integer is? An integer is a whole number with no fraction or no decimal. Great, thank you so much. And then a ratio. Ratio, a uh, relationship between two numbers that's described by the number of times one value is contained in another. Okay, and that so now we're getting into to ratios, and we hear ratios all the time, right? And now let's go into a rational number versus an irrational number, and then we're gonna go back and I can talk a little bit more about ratios. So what's an what's a rational number? Any number or integer that can be written as a rational as a ratio. Mm-hmm. And then what about an irrational number? Irrational can't cannot be written as a right a ratio because it has a non terminating with an unidentifiable pattern. Yes, and that should have I need to add it, it's a non terminating decimal uh, and mm -hmm. uh, and an unidentifiable pattern. So we'll go back. Let's let's go back then and, and look at this. So all of my life. I thought that an irrational number was called irrational because it was crazy, right? It wasn't <laughs> like, you know, they're like, the square root of two, that don't make no sense. <laughs> I was like, oh, the square root of two doesn't make any sense. It's irrational. That is not why it's called irrational, y'all. <laughs> like, it's not. <laughs> I thought it was. It is because, look, ratio is in, you see, ratio. It cannot be written as a ratio. That's all it means. It cannot. You cannot write the square root of two as a fraction. You can't. And so that's what makes it an irrational number. It's not crazy. Okay. <laughs> I thought so for a long time. And um, and so we're looking at ratios, and ratios is really the basis of of of, of number sense, okay? We get into numbers and there's only a few different types. You got an integer and a ratio. And then there's, you know, different ways. You also have irrational numbers. They can be rational or irrational. So um, ratios are all about relationships, the relationship to another number. So you have to have a reference to another number in order to identify that number. Like that's basically what it means. Now, let's go into here. And I already did this one, so I'll, we'll just keep this one. I was gonna do the division, but we'll keep this one for now. So the Egyptians actually had a, multiple, a, a, a way of multiplying that uh, became the basis of the, the binary um, computer system. So this is the basis of the binary computer system. And how the Egyptians multiplied is, say we've got four times 42, okay? Down one side, you start with one, and then two, and then squares. You do the square of two, the cube. You keep going down as far as you think you're gonna, you know, you can just go down a few. Um, and then you just fill that in. One is one, two is two. Two squared is 
4. 2 cubed is 8. And now, so that is our first side, right? And we want to get to where we have on this column, a uh, we get to the number 4. And for example, just to, I chose an easier number, so this was actually um, a square, the square of 2. But let's say if I said 5, for example, let's say if I said 5 instead of 4, then I would look at, I would need to go down to 4, and then I have a 1 here, okay? So just remember that. Now, for 42, that's the number we're multiplying, correct? We start with the number, which is 1. Then we double it, right? Because that's what we're doing here. If you look at this pattern, 1, 2, and then it doubles again, 4. So what do we have to do here? Just double it, 4. On the other side, we keep this this is, if you notice, these numbers are doubling here on this side. So you can do the same on here, 42, 84, 168, 336, okay? Now, if you're trying to, trying to find the answer for 4 times 4, 42, we would say you could go here, here's 4, and you just go straight across, and you see that the answer is 168. The reason that I found this so interesting is I don't know if y'all have had this issue, but many of my students have a hard time with rote memory. And I was one of those students who had a hard time with rote memory. And I basically, as an adult, realized that I am not a computer. So I don't have to do rote memory. <laughs> like, I don't have to do rote because I, can, I have other tools that I can use and I'm not a computer. And it just, it's hard for me. Um, rote memory is pretty, it's, it's not a human thing, okay? It is here, you don't have to memorize your facts because all you, the only skills you need to be able to multiply are to, to add. That's all you gotta do. So if you're addition, you can just really hone in on the addition skills and, and that rote memory, the, you don't have to focus on the rote memory where that gets very, very, very like, just like an ease in your heart is when you're learning, when, when students are learning division because long division has caused just terror in the lives of so many children and, <laughs> and teachers trying to teach it because, you know, once you start trying to divide really large numbers, and you got to figure out what the multiples are and what the factors are that number are. And if you already don't have the strongest number sense, it is a joke. <laughs> like, it's just like, it's very difficult to do. So imagine if instead of having to divide, let's say if we were doing four, we, we were doing 36 divided by four, you could use the same strategy. I have it over here for the division, but you could use the same strategy to get to find out what the answer is and um this is it, it's a it, this system is is so streamlined and it's actually it's 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 so practical that it became the basis of every computer that every computer we're using right now like all how this is how computers add and this is how computers multiply okay so um why don't we learn this in school? Any ideas? I mean, we could try out, if y'all want to try out some different ones, you can try out different numbers. I've been trying it out. It works. Um, and, and you, it really, it, it's, it's such a, it's, it's a more fluid system. I mean, it just makes way more sense than the butterfly math method and even the foil method. I didn't try them all. And this is, this is so, and so, so this knowledge that came from, from, from the, from, from ancestors who looked like me right? This knowledge that came from people who looked like me and became the basis of basically 
a technology, like all of technology that um, is dominated by people who don't look like me. And imagine if our students knew that actually this came from our culture. This is, this is, this is my culture. And, and it's, and it's, there's, and so, so there's ways to, to, to personalize. I love what, uh, uh, thank you so, thank you so much for sharing Gemma. Yeah. They're finding ways to, um, to personalize, uh, what, uh, what we're doing so that, uh, students, so that students can connect to it and being open to systems. Um, because this has really shifted the way that I, the way that I look at, uh, yes, for sure. So this was, this was made for, uh, what I was hoping to use this for was more of the, the mild to moderate as they're shifting out of, of middle school and into high school so that they have, they have a little tool. And I want, I'm going to add something, I'm going to add another page to it as well. Thank you so much, Rosemary, um, for pointing that out. So, so this is, I wouldn't recommend this type. I recommend, you know, you could, I recommend you teach the Egyptian multiplication. Like I, I recommend that strategy for younger students because that's something that they can grasp and, um, and it makes multiplication and division a lot more accessible. But this particular tool, this is just something I put together because I like making stuff like this. I encourage you to make your own and Canva is a great resource and we have access to it for free. We have access to the pro version and the beautiful thing about it is anything you create is yours. So, you know, of course you can use it for the district, but you also want, you can also have it for your own, you know, create your own resources that you can use later or even sell. Um, and so, um, so that's something I just wanted to share as well. And let's get back to our, uh, let's get back to our, okay, I wanna take a little, let me see if we have a break. Okay, we've got a break coming up. We're at 4.30. I would like, okay, so those are, those are a couple of things. And, and digital tools that I use include the, the Google Forms. So Google Forms provide a great way for you to organize projects. And let me just pull one up. So you can, it's a, it's a great way to organize your projects so that, um, step by step the students know exactly what they're going to be doing i don't make the the answers required because um then they, it's hard for them to turn it in if they don't have the answer and even if i tell them just put something down i'm not going to grade you on it so it's easier just to make the answers not required so they can keep coming back um but this is what i use so for example nope for example uh, for the business club, uh, each, each week we met, they filled this out and they filled this out in their small group. So, uh, we start the first couple of days we talked, the first session we talked about, um, they came up with their agreements and expectations and every class I put it in there. So they had to fill this out and restate what the agreements were, restate what the consequences were that they came up with. And um, they also had to uh, to grade each other on the, the like check off the jobs that their um, their their group did, and um, a provide accountability. Okay, so I just kind of had that at the beginning of each one. You will hear some words. I didn't care. It's more important for me not to have to keep repeating the expectations. So <laughs> uh, they might get some pushback. Next is, uh, is, and so this is a great way to plan out your classes. Uh, next was the, uh, I, you know, I have my little guiding video on how to make their logo for their business. Then they needed to upload their logo here. So you can upload files. Um, what problem does your business solve? So remember, I was guiding them not just around businesses, you know, to make money, but how is it actually serving your community? Um, here's a video on how to, to, on like how to market your product, the three, like the, I think it was like the three P's of marketing. Then having them think about where they, how, where they were going to sell their, their product. And, uh, let's see what else we have here. I think there's a little, oop, there we go. So yes, three ways that they plan to market and promote their business. And then where is the last 
the little, and I think that was it for that one. And then the best thing about it, and I, this is a copy that I made, so we're not, uh, yeah, you're not going to see the responses. Um, but the responses come up in a, uh, in a sheet. Yes. <laughs> the responses come up in a sheet and you have all the information. So you're not tracking people down for their logo or anything. You have it all together. So from an organizational standpoint, I just love, I love the forms and you can just up, put it right into the Google classroom. Um, it's there, they're really forms are great. It's just forms really, really helped me. And uh, if I get a chance to teach another one of these workshops, I would love to teach folks how to make apps because you can make an app from without coding and, um, and specifically for, for, for our jobs and working with, with youth who really need, um, uh, like, uh, we, we have a lot of data we have to keep track of um, around student growth. And imagine if you could create an app that already has, you know, can help you with that data or allow the student to track. So that's something you can um, think about as well. Um, and then from this particular project, so that project, of course, started pre-COVID and I had 10 students. At the end of the school year, I had eight students. So I think I had one of the highest retention rates of any of the, the teachers, like um, as far as participation and students made uh, soap. Here's some soap that the student made. Uh, some students did custom design shoes. Some students made masks. They actually um, ordered two students asked for sewing machines so they could make masks. Uh, and then we also, um, oh, here's their, their SWAT. So they had to assess their businesses and come up with the business strengths and weaknesses. And I create a uh, fillable PDFs. And so we got a motorcycle coming by. So I create fillable uh, PDFs so they can just put it in and um, and send it. And uh, we were able to get uh, local uh, business owners involved. So Chef Eskinder from over at Radio Africa uh, invited us to, to the restaurant. We, he cooked food for us. He talked to them about how he started his business coming here as a refugee. And um, from there to starting and how much work it, you know, he put into really creating a business. Um, and then he made some delicious jambalaya for us. So finding opportunities for students, especially the old, well, I think any student, but um, for, for the older students, you know, like, I mean, I love elementary school because they listen to you, but once you get into middle school, like the last thing they want to do is hear anything from a teacher. and. I don't blame them after, you know, we just watched that video. I don't blame them. And so uh, I try to provide opportunities for guest speakers and experts to come in and the students love it. And I see their behavior when we have guests is phenomenal. It's really amazing. Um, and, they, and they ask about it. They'll ask about that person. You know, they keep asking me if he's gonna cook us some more food. So. Um, I just wanted to share that. I know that some folks were talking about uh, like how to uh, keep your students, um, like if they're doing internships and stuff like that. Um, so that could be a tool. Now we are at, ooh, we got 15 minutes. Okay, we're gonna have to make a choice. So the IEP language, all right, first let's do, let's do a quick pause. And uh, do folks, how do folks feel about um, like a three, five, a five minute break? And then we can close. I think, okay, keep going. Okay, so, uh, so here we go. So understanding IEP language. And let me see, I think I, I know I linked that. So let's just get back to that. Uh, Nikki, I see that we have a hand up from Luella. I don't know if that was her wanting to speak. Oh yeah, just hop on, hop on the mic. Oh okay, I um, I'm not used to uh, opening the link, and then I I see I see your material, but I don't know how to save it. And for me personally, Luella, um, I can help you with that, Nikki. If you want to keep going, great. Thank you so much, Nicole. Great, thank you. 
And so understanding your, uh, so understanding IEPs uh, and these IEPs at a glance. So what I'm gonna share, let's see if this comes up. Oh, that's the same folder anyways. I am gonna share um, an example of some goals. And I think what we'll have time to do is maybe choose one goal and uh, we'll, we'll brainstorm together some activities or strategies or ways that you would support if you saw a student who, who had a goal that was like that. So let's see. What well, did you hear? Copy? All right, so here are, here are just a, a few goals. Um, and then let's take one. So let me go up so we all can see. And does anybody have a goal that, that's, uh, that's uh, popping out to them that they, they'd want us to, to, uh, to address? Can we you got the screen a little bigger. It's hard to see the text. Oh, let me zoom in. Initiating. So we're stating like perfect example goal number one, it by August. So you have a kind of a set time that mm. they need to formulate complex sentence. So they might have done simple sentence, but 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 reach for maybe next year's um, August, maybe this was written last year. So it's stating that the whole school year to reach end of the school year is to formulate a complex sentence. Simple sentences, spot ran home. Well, you wanna make it complex by spot ran home and skipped to the playground. Does that make sense? Yes. And and so what what I want to hear is how what what kind of activity or I think you you start the first thing you you stated I guess is the first part, right? Is the baseline. So you'd say the baseline is the student right now is able to make a simple sentence, right? So you're like, okay, that student is able to make a simple sentence and then their goal by the end of the year, you know, this, those, those were just, I just pulled these from some old, old documents. So the goal by the end of the year would be to, cause this, I see what you're saying. It says 20, yeah, not right now, um, would be, so say for next year would be um, for them to be able to use uh, complex sentences. And so, and so what, what are some, um, what are some things that you would uh, that you would do? Like, what what would be your game plan for supporting that student for for that year do, within this goal? Um, make little cards. Excellent. So and. Sometimes we play goldfish to get him to familiarize a list of words that you want him to know. So first you will get a little poster to have him bring home or on a digital. Have him repeat the words maybe three a day or whatever goal. Get to know some of the words that are complex like conjunction or subordinate clause subordinate words, I mean, and then aim towards having him know those words first, familiarizing it, and then play a game. That's great. I love it. Um, exactly. So first you want to, whatever the new material is, you want to introduce them to it and you want to give them many different ways to to um, engage with it right so you're they're engaging with you uh, during the during the uh, during the lesson then you give them a poster so they can take home 
and they can be practicing at home and then you give them a game and maybe that game they also can play with their parents at home and that's like their homework assignment is you know play this game with your parents um and then just a couple of questions so so would you um would you and for things like that would they they're like subordinating conjunction um you could depending on their you could yeah well yeah exactly you should they they then learn um some they 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 learn the context like they learn the strategy around language um and and um and then these particular like what are these different types of words so these words have a name they're all under this name and there's lots of different ways and what do they do they connect they connect smaller sentences and uh then um so that that's wonderful that's great and then i think that paul had said here also i think we'll have a time for one more paul had said that uh initiating work okay so we got initiating work and does someone is someone able to read the goal out loud for us uh, i guess 20 25th, 2020, when struck on the problem or questioning class, Stanley will use his resources to understand what he needs to do, to do to get started on the classwork and four out of five opportunities as measured by teacher feedback and charts. Mm-hmm. And um, so, so what's a uh, area of the, oh, someone put one in the chat too. Okay. So, so what the, so what, where would you get started with, the, with this? You just got this and let's say it's 2021 for us. So this is what they have the year to work on. Um, what, what would you, what would your first, like, yeah, what, how would you get started with a student on like kind of supporting them with this goal? All right. So, one of the first things uh, that uh, that I may may be a prize. There you go. So yeah, an incentive <laughs> and incentives. I I go back and forth with people around incentives, um, even with with parents and with teachers. And in the real world, there are incentives. Okay, it's just how you work, you get paid. That's an incentive. It's you know I do this work because of a lot of reasons. But we also have to, we live in a, money, a, a society that we need money. So, you know, um, and, um, and thinking about the incentives. So I started think, rethinking incentives. And what I did when I was in middle school was to, Gen Ed Para working in middle school age two, uh, is, is to, the incentive doesn't have to be a thing. The main thing that our students want is power. They want power and they want control. And so giving them power, earning privileges, um, earning, earning uh, control over their time, uh, earning opportunities to, to be a leader in the school. And so my first year, uh, my, my first year as a um, inclusion specialist, I had a student who was on a kindergarten level of reading. He was in sixth grade and he would sit underneath the desk and bark at people. And um, he was, uh, you know, we would meet, we met one-on-one -on -one and our first conversation, y'all know how that went. There's nothing wrong with you. You don't need to bark. You just need to use your words to tell me what it is that you need and I will support you. And so, um, what I ended up doing is that student was so far behind in his reading that, that he, it was uncomfortable for him. And so during reading time, he would earn time to actually go and read story picture books to a younger student, to a student in first grade. And that student was also, you know, being served by a special education teacher. So that student also needed extra support. And so quickly he moved from being the kid who barked at people from underneath his desk to the kid who got permission to leave the classroom by himself and go um, to another floor and be a teacher assistant. And I did that with a couple of students and both 
of those students showed amazing, amazing growth. And, uh, and it was because um, they, they, you know, they got what they wanted. They wanted power. They felt empowered. Uh, and, um, and so when we're thinking about a prize or an incentive, um, it can get really exhausting, you know, <laughs> trying to think of like little trinkets and things. Um, but really, let's think about child psychology and what they really want. You know, that's what they want. And can I also just add, um, at this level or any level, when you, to your point about students with wanting power i think when we see goals we say okay his resources are teacher peer computer etc asking the student what resources they can identify also empowers them and using that to help measure the goal because now they have ownership of the resources that they can select versus as the educator saying well did they go to the computer did they go to the peer setting those resources resources for them so asking that student to empower them to give their feedback on what resources best support their learning is also helpful. Mm -hmm. And they and they might have a whole bunch of other resources that you know they could share with other students that we didn't even come up with. Um, that thank you so much for adding. And uh, we are coming close to time. And I know that some folks added a few things in the chat. So Rosemarie said the area of need was vocabulary. The goal of getting to comp uh, yeah, comprehending short, simple, short, uh, short words, starting with examples like short or tall with symbols and pictures. Exact. So bringing in multi-sensory, sensory. So we have access to sound. Well, I think we should uh, soon have access to soundtrack again, which allows students to make uh, make music and make podcasts and songs and stuff like that. Uh, so even coming up with little little rhyming songs and they can put little like once they finish they can put music to it so there's a lot of different ways I'm gonna this is all gonna be saved and I'll go through the chat I'll probably have time to get back to everyone by next week uh, by the end of next week um, to answer any questions that I missed please don't forget to fill out the feedback form thank you everyone uh, and uh, remember, if remember, you can access these, and I'll also add the the video here into the chat. So, did anyone have any last minute questions? Throw them in the chat. I may not be able to answer them all right now, but if you throw them in the chat, then I can go back to them later. And um, and thank you so much, Nicole, for your support. No problem. Uh, excellent, excellent uh, session this afternoon to end the, the week. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, I think we are. Thank you. You're welcome. You're excellent. Does anybody have any other questions, thoughts, concerns? Thank you very much. I, um, you know, I, um, I've been, uh, I'm a family liaison uh, in the schools for almost 15 years now. and. Um, one of the things I use to um, incentive and motivate students, I done uh, leather workshops because uh, sometimes they, you know they they gotta be able to use a ruler and measure things. They gotta be able to cut things. It comes with like you know they have to first thinking what they gonna do, design it, put measures to it, uh, then cut it, put it together, punch the holes. How many holes gonna be in each side? It has to be with the same on the other side. So when you do a project like that, they get all the skills that they know already, but you just guide them. Mm -hmm. And it makes it easy. And then you compare that to like, to a building, you just tell them, you just have a lot of more things, but it's still the same. You still have to like, to do a door, you have to like measure what kind of door you want and make that door and then the frame of the door has to be for the door. So you already have, and then you'll be building like Legos and they get better. Like I do a cooking class, you know, sometimes and you just got to get the students comfortable. Mm -hmm. And they will, you know, they will teach each other. Like, like with this, is, uh, uh, this is learning uh, what I've been doing because my job is telling the parents, you know, make sure your students like get into the Zoom and get in class. And then the excuse that we're saying, oh, well, I don't have the, the, 
the pass the code for to enter class. I don't even have how, how to do it and this and that, right? Mm -hmm. I said, well, let me talk to the student. I talked to the student and said, look, you don't give me excuses. Your friend, your best friend is in class all day. So you call your friend and tell you the, to give you the code. <laughs> and if anything, he talks to you and you understand him. So tell him how to do it. Tell him, tell me how to do it. And then, you know, and, and it's easy. And it's like, it's just a matter of like, have them use their own resources and they have them. They have them. There is, they, most times the kids who are like, understand more to a teacher who they quote unquote is market, they love the other kids. They want to be friends with them. So they say, you know, get that kid over there. Tell him, hey, teach me this. And I teach you that. It's changed. So I think it's, this is a, a, a great workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for sharing. And, and yes, uh, peer support. I'm trying to figure out a system so students who want to give peer support can like, you know, so teach so students know which student they can go to. And that's exactly what we did last year. I would be like, I know you, you know, you got such and such as number. They're not in class right now. Text them. <laughs> you know, like, you know, we would go and and um and um so going back to what Nicole was saying about empowering them to to utilize their resources and to come up with a path of 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 how to make the learning work for them, you know, how they can individualize it for themselves. Thank you so much. Um thank you everyone. Thank you so much for all of your wonderful feedback and um I look forward to hopefully, you know, doing more of these. I really enjoyed it. Um, have a wonderful weekend. Take good care of yourself and um, have a wonderful start to your year. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank, Bye. You. Thank Bye. you so much, Nicole. Bye. Thank you. I'll email you, Nakia. Great. Thank okay. you. No problem. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Be well. Thank you. Bye, everyone. I'm Bye. about to end it. Bye.